Alright, welcome everybody. Uh, this unit is for provide first aid. The unit code is HLT AID 003. Uh, I will be your trainer, a joy Cena. Um, if you've got any questions, don't hesitate to um, shoot me an email or if you see me, just go ahead and ask uh, if you've got any questions. Throughout this um, recording, feel free to pause and complete any of the tasks. If you get confused or uh, need to come back, you can come and revise and just, you know, have a um, have another play at the video. Throughout the slides, we will be pausing for the activities. So when you guys complete them, come back and resume the video um, at your own pace if you need to. So let's get into it. So, uh, respond to an emergency situation. Essentially, when we are, uh, you know, providing first aid, the reason why we are learning this unit is essentially you don't have anybody at the workplace, let's say, that's, you know, if you're not near a hospital or if you're not at a, um, at a paramedics, um, you know, uh, workshop, you're not essentially going to be providing on the spot care with somebody who's got a medical degree or um, any sort of knowledge about medicine or how to deal with these things. So this is a very much a bare bone, very much the minimum of what you need to do in, to just assure if somebody gets you know injured or they need CPR or um, you know if there's bleeding cuts things like that into how to just essentially hold and what's the word I would say you know curate a um, a skill set within you to um, just hold off on them going into a serious position until you know the paramedics get to you so Mostly, you know, in your workplace, you'll be facing cuts, bleeding, um, sort of thing. Band, you know, you have to do bandages, things. Um, you know, maybe people are convulsing, um, having allergic reactions, things like that. But when it does get serious, as in people stop breathing, that's when you, you know, need to be able to see if they are breathing, what the proper, you know, positionings are for CPR and the processes are for that. So we'll be learning that as well throughout this. Uh, knowing about a little bit about poisons and um, how to control infection in, in a small little the time frame that you do have between you know caring for the person until the emergency services do arrive. Um, how to keep them in a comfortable position, how to recognize you know hazardous situations, any future hazards that may arise things like that so when you're going to be recognizing an emergency situation you need to think about uh, what sort of noises are happening you know that's not going to be like um, people are going to be laughing most likely most people are going to be screaming or it's going to be loud it's not going to be quiet and um, or sometimes it can be quiet it can be too quiet and then the person is not making any noise maybe they're choking or uh, maybe they've already had a stroke so you got to think about what is the norm in that environment and are you in the norm and if it's not normal why so then you need to investigate see how you can make the situation a bit better uh, smells think about you know burning um, you know rotten egg smell for gas leaks things like that why is it odd why does it smell odd is it different to the normal environmental smell uh, sights you know if you're obviously seeing odd things happening it's not a normal situation it's a, if there's ambulances around or if people are crowding around somebody you know there's something up abnormal behavior people might be you know intoxicated and fighting or maybe it's not normal for them to clutch you know on the chest kind of thing you know maybe they're uh, on the floor they're not really able to uh, communicate you with you or they're breathing really heavily 
things like that that you need to recognize so there's many more cases it's just you need to know on a daily basis how you you will know on how people react and deal with you and if it's strange you need to investigate why it's strange why is it different why is it not the same as it was yesterday so examples of emergencies could be an unconscious patient or casualty on the floor or um, you know places like a motor vehicle accident uh, abdominal pain it could be chest pain breathing difficulty if they're choking uh, allergic reactions any industrial accidents, suicide attempts, um, you know, bleeding, anything like that that is not normal and you don't expect to see every day essentially is an emergency. Alright, so activity 1A. So how can you recognize an emergency situation? List at least three signs of an emergency situation and give an example for each. So if we're recognizing an emergency situation we need to know that it's not the normal. It's an abnormal situation so we need to think about are there odd noises that are coming? Um, can we see people's um, reactions are not as normal as it, you would expect in that environment? Are there odd smells? Um, can you see something physically that is odd and out of place? Things are broken or shattered or um, you know, you would expect um, a door to be on the car's driver's side and it's on the floor. Or you would expect a car to be physically looking like a car but now it's all crumpled up. So now you want to, you know, think about, okay, in an emergency situation you might see somebody bleeding, you might see somebody on the floor unconscious, you might see somebody um, choking or um, having uh, fights or bleeding from places that they shouldn't be bleeding from or having an allergic reaction, uh, reaction sw swelling up, their skin swelling up, um, choking from internal swelling, things like that that you need to check. Okay. Alright, so complete that uh, when you're ready to come back, unpause the video and we can continue on with the next one. So pause it now, complete it, come back. 1.2. Identify, assess and manage immediate hazards to health and safety of self and others. So most likely you're doing this unit um, to either learn how to deal with any emergency situations that come up at the workplace or that your employer wants you to um, you know, essentially provide first aid to any employees that you work with and make sure that they um, are in the safest position until the paramedics or any external help is needed come. So at least you have the bare minimum of knowledge to control s some you know, excessive emergency situations until you get the right authorities to you. So first we want to take up um, a thought process of the hazards and risks that are in place and the possible hazards and risks that could be created by me or the casualty being there. So in case of a kitchen, if you think about, let's say if the person has been burnt and I try and treat the person right there in the kitchen, well now we have to think, are they working? Are there people moving around? It's not safe for that casualty. Or the people that are working there. So I need to move that person. So I need to, you know, lessen the hazards for the people around it, and the person that's been hurt. So then I need to think about the risk. Okay, if I do potentially, if I don't have any other place to do it, um, what are the risk levels? If I do it in front of um, a more frequented place of the other colleagues, if they're walking around more, maybe I need to reduce that risk by taking them to a corner where they don't need to use it straight away. So they're not walking around there as much. And maybe I'm limited to space, so I need to take them to a place where it is uh, least frequented. Okay, removing them from the hazard. You know. So it's it's all about thinking um, logically and thinking about what is the best for the people around us and the person that's been injured or um, in a serious situation there. So how we're going to be re risking 
the manage there so first you want to identify the hazards okay so let's say if you're in the environment think about and um, the heat there or think about if they are on an odd ledge or if they're near traffic things like that how do we get them out of there so now we need to assess the risk is it more important for me to move them onto a, a more even surface to provide CP, uh, CPR or do I just start putting um, you know putting pressure on their chest on the hood of their car so okay we're thinking about uh, the pers person is unconscious let's try and do CPR now or um, if we can move them out of the way of traffic it might be a bit safer for me and you and then we can continuously start providing CPR alright so uh, then think about like I said controlling the risks moving forward if you're going to be taking the action how do we control all of that how do we set up a perimeter with if there's people we need to give them responsibility pick some people that you think you know look like they would be responsible and say look guys I need some space can you make sure that nobody gets into this area while I provide this uh, first aid or this CPR or um, or use this AED on the person that's been injured um, make sure you get them if you think it's going to be serious if you're up to CPR you need to get them to call a um, a medical professional like uh, the ambulance or the first responders essentially to that issue there if you need it and if it's if it, you have to think about it if it's a cut on their hands you need, don't need to call the ambulance but if they've severely um, punctured their body uh, like let's say if they've been stabbed by a knife you you will have to call triple O alright and then after you've done that reviewing the control measures what you've done how you've managed them all and then consulting with others in, in the sense that have you done the right thing have you debriefed everybody and on the debrief um, if there is the same situation or something similar can it be better moving forward alright so identifying hazards you will need to inspect the environment consult with others and review all available information so most likely if you are going to be the first aid uh, provider at your workplace you will be somebody that um, most likely has been working there for a long time so it will be your responsibility to know the venue know the locations of um, first aid boxes and uh, know your way around the venue or the workplace environment and where everything is and uh, what the safest position is in that workplace like if I was saying um, a metal work workshop and they deal with metal I wouldn't be trying to give somebody first aid where they're welding right I would try and take them out to a place where it's cool where there's less noise where I can communicate with the person that's injured they can hear me um, you know I can provide some first aid you know bandage them up or try and um, cool down the burn at least until somebody else um, can bring in further equipment that I can use or if they're asthmatic I can give them the puffer in a quiet place they can sit down give them a glass of water things like that make it comfortable and then reassess with them make them ask them questions and see if they're comfortable if it's getting worse or if it's getting better so the more I can have communication with the person the better this situation will be okay so assessing risk we're trying to think of what type of harm could occur from any hazards around us uh, will it be serious? How serious will it be? What will be the possible outcomes of those hazards around us? Um, the factors which influence how serious the harm could be. So think about, you know, if we're thinking about the location of a heavy object. We're not going to put it high up. So if it does drop, it creates a big um, injury. The heavier the object, we put it the lower in location. So if it does drop it creates less uh, damage to anything near it compared to putting it higher up which would give it more force as it goes down um, or velocity at least how many people does the hazard affect or could affect thinking about people around us uh, if they're crowding what could you know if we if we've got a possible person fainting in Central Park and we have all these tourists um, spreading around us and they're crowding around us 
how do we remove that? We need to make sure that we have enough space that they in turn can be a protective barrier for this person. So we need to think about how do we change that situation into a positive situation. Instead of having them hover over us, we instruct them, please can you give us some space? We need to make sure that this person is not overcrowded. We need to provide the first aid in time so this doesn't become more serious than it is right now. Things like that. Are there hazards that could cause risks to quickly escalate? So things like you know oncoming traffic, um, noise, uh, any potential objects that might be in the person, removing that object. You know, sometimes it is much better to keep a knife in the wound than to take it out because it might be stopping the bleeding where if you take the knife out now you don't know how to control the bleeding and you don't have the right equipment. So think about what is happening. Is like that thing being there, is that okay? Is it not okay? You know, sometimes you'll see around the world people that have been shot they don't necessarily re remove the bullet they uh, because they don't know if removing the bu bullet will ca cause more bleeding so um, it's not always the case that if you are injured that the first thing to do is take out whatever you've got in there wait um, assess it see how the person is reacting to it and then move forward okay alright so the likelihood of risk how often are people exposed to hazards so you know you're exposed to hazards all the time you're not gonna be living a life that is all safe and you know you're in a bun you know a plastic bouncy castle and everything's soft and doesn't hurt but it's about how do we keep ourselves safe if we walk on the street we're making sure to wear shoes so we don't get hurt and step on something sharp right so how do we minimize it how long might people be exposed to the hazard so think about um, you know working near fire is dangerous if we can keep it to a minimum um, we can reduce the risk of getting burnt because we're not there and getting careless all the time Okay. How effective are current controls in reducing risk? So, if I was going to say um, that John, a colleague of mine, is always using the ladder incorrectly and he is not locking it in place and then, you know, repeating that task and then someday it just collapses on him and he gets a big injury, um, or thinking about having water on the floor and the likelihood of, of the floor slipping. If it's a rubber floor, there's less chance of people slipping on that floor than a tiled floor. So we need to think about how we're going to reduce that risk. Essentially, it, it could be a training issue where we tell the people, look, we don't want any water on the floor. If it does, we need to mop it up straight away. And that solves a lot of the problems. Um, could any changes in your organization increase the likelihood? So let's say if we have new equipment that's producing oil leaks and it produces oil on the floor, you know, people are going to slip. So how do we manage that? How do we rectify that? Maybe we need to get some maintenance people in to see why it's leaking oil. Or maybe we need to have a catchment area for that machine to catch the oil as it produces the oil and then have somebody clean it and that be their job so that people aren't around that hazard and hurt themselves unknowingly. That hazard is more likely to cause harm because of the environment. So think about, um, you know, if you're outside in a park somewhere, if a dog is, you know, present, they might be curious and approach you and then um, you, you never know, they might be aggressive and bite you. But let's say if you're in the veterinary clinic and there's a dog there, you've got people that are trained to handle dogs. So you're not worried as much compared to just being out in an open park. Could the way people act and behave affect the likelihood of a hazard causing harm? So of course, um, people who are skilled with using equipment will use it uh, appropriately compared to people who won't. So you know it's all about skill level it's all about maturity knowledge things like that 
Um, do the difference between individuals in the environment make it more likely to harm, uh, for harm to occur? Of course, um, you know, you've got sizes, size differences, you've got age differences, people do things differently than others. You know, if um, I fall on somebody that's 60 kilos, um, and, you know, it's not going to be a good thing for me to fall on them with my 100 kilo body, uh, compared to somebody that's about my size, if I fall on them, it's not going to be as much of a problem than to fall on somebody that's 50 or 60 kilos. Right? So people defer size, shape, all those things. And it will affect them differently. Alright, so managing risk, we've got three levels. Um, eliminate the hazard, substitute the hazard for something safer, isolate the hazard for people from people, reduce the risks through controls, Level three, we've got reduce exposure to the hazard using administrative actions, use personal protective equipment, so PPE, such as, you know, we've got aprons, chef jackets, you know, thick chef jackets, steel cap shoes or work boots, things like that will make the workplace a lot safer. If we do drop a knife, it's not gonna, I know that it's not going to go through the chef's boots because it's got steel cap in it, um, compared to if they just wear their joggers in to the restaurant, I know if they drop something it's going to be a lot more painful, so I know, like, hey man, go and get, um, go and change your shoes and then come back and start work. It's just safer for all of us. If I um, accidentally drop something on his foot, um, you know, I might lose him for three weeks or three months or might lose him forever, so we don't want to really take a risk at any point. The lower risks we have, the better the workplace will be. Identifying hazards, um, types of hazards, we got, you know, gas um, in our workplace, um, you know, thinking about the explosion factor, if we're using flames, um, how high that they can go, how, you know, vicious the gas can be in, you know, how they're coming out of the equipment that we use it in, uh, storage locations, um, if we're using faulty equipment, things like that. Um, electricity, you know, if it's, um, let's say especially with us, we've got water around in the kitchen, then we've got equipment that we use around the water. If we've got faulty equipment, people can get electrocuted. Fire, we are always dealing with fire and burns in the kitchen. So thinking about how we can minimize that, wearing the, you know, chef's jacket, um, having full sleeves so we don't get as much splatter from hot oils things like that. Assault is another thing. It, it's not very frequent but it does happen. I would say more in the pub and clubs. Um, sometimes it does happen in restaurants, very rarely. It's more internally as you know you can get a bit hot-headed in the kitchen. You're already hot physically and somebody you know most people who do this job aren't really doing it because it's a good payday. They're doing it because they enjoy it and they have some sort of connection to it and most likely most people send out food because they think it's good. They don't just send out anything. So when somebody says something negative, it does get them in a personal way. So it can get a bit um, rowdy in our industry. Blood, you know, you're cross-contaminating, you're contaminating people's food if you're getting your own blood. If you're getting, let's say, uh, beef blood into seafood, you know, that's creating a big issue there. Uh, liquids um, from those meats, now the, that seafood is unusable now, it's been contaminated. Um, so you might want to wear gloves or you might put down you know, put it in a container that's leak proof, things like that. Alright, so in your own words, define the term hazard. So if I was going to define the term hazard, I would basically be talking about anything that could potentially cause or have um, the possibility to cause um, injury to people around me or me or anybody in the workplace or in a in any environment essentially okay so now you got to consider what the risk levels are and things like that okay we are associated with 
different items and um, hazards that are um, present in those environments. How can you identify hazards in your environment? Simple, um, do a walk around. See what you see as a, um, as a potential hazard in the workplace. Could be wires, exposed wires, managed equipment, you know. Um, could be wet floor, possible um, damaged products, anything. Okay, so you're doing a hazard analysis and a walkthrough in conducting a report essentially. It could be verbal if you're, um, you know, if you're not a higher up, but most managers would do a written report in that case if they're doing a um, hazard analysis around their workplace. How can the risk associated with hazards be assessed? Think about, um, you know, can it cause harm? What the levels are, such as this will lead to possible injury. This may lead to possible injury, or the likelihood of this to lead to a possible injury is very minimal. So you need to, I think there are certain um, criteria on how high the risks are so as you go through um, you know your analysis of the workplace you would give it a rating um, and what the risks would be with the hazards that are around so if you're thinking about blenders um, possible mutilating of my hand if I don't understand what and how to use the equipment because then the blender blades will chop up my fingers okay how can you manage risk in your environment? Refer to hierarchy of risk and control in your answer. So like we were talking about before, it's the, you know, the circle um, as we we're talking about. So can I eliminate the risk in any way? So can I remove that machine? Can I not use that mop bucket? Or, you know, can I not mop there? Can I just sweep there? If I can't, what can I substitute? Okay, instead of doing a wet mop, can I steam so it might get um, dry quicker? Okay, if I can't substitute um, anything else there, all right, how can I engineer the problem? Can I get somebody in to um, maintain that equipment? Can I get somebody to uh, possibly buy something else um, or have somebody create a solution for that problem? Okay, administrative controls could be such as um, can I train the staff around me or the people around me to um, handle that hazard a bit better to lessen the risk. And then PP, wearing protective um, equipment is very important because automatically you're reducing the level of risk that is present. So wearing, um, you know, not wearing loose clothing, sh steel cap shoes, tying up your hair, you know, really allows you to know yourself and the presence of self. Um, because let's say if you've got loose hair and it's flowing around, you don't know when it's going to get caught into a machine. Okay. How can you manage risk in the environment? Okay, we've already talked about that. Identify and assess three hazards in your workplace and associated risk. Suggest how each of these could be managed. Your answer should be approximately one page in length. So, you um, don't need to do too much on that one. Essentially, break it down into three, break your page down into three, talk about the hazard itself. So, if we're talking about our workplace, could be sharp objects, wet floors, exposed um, PowerPoints to water, could be um, power lines on the floor that might get in the way. Mm, possible um, potential burning of skin through cooking or oil burns or marks and things like that. How we eliminate them by having properly trained chefs or uh, replacing those equipment that are broken, uh, having covers installed, maybe give training to the staff, have them wear um, the proper PPE for the workplace, things like that. Okay, so mention three, break it down, how are you going to fix them, 
uh, how are you going to manage the risk if not uh, eliminating it and, you know, from the situation um, and yeah that should be it so pause the video now if you're uh, feeling like um, that you understand or you can go back and listen complete those activities there once you're ready come back and we can move on to the next one okay assist the casualty and recognize the knees for first aid response um, assess the situation and seek assistance from emergency response services so to assess the situation complete the DRS ABCD check okay so D for danger R for response S is sent for help A is for airway B for breathing C CPR and the last thing defibrillation with an AED so first of all when we approach the area we'd want to check for any possible dangers is there moving cars is there a dog is there um, you know other debris falling from the sky is there rain things like that okay then uh, we need to see if the casualty is responding to us are they saying no no leave me alone or yes can you help me things like that okay if you're not getting any response and if they're saying or they are giving you responses but it's not really strong or you need help and you feel like you can't take the situation by yourself send for help find somebody in or around your vicinity and tell them look I need you to call triple O or I need you to um, get the first aid kit things like that send for help make sure you stay with the, the casualty then you need to check if they're not responding to you see if their airway is open check in their mouth pop in the, um, pop in the, the side of their mouth and see if their tongue is straight out or if it's folded back in so you want to put your finger in and then take out their tongue and keep their mouth open so that it's clear for them to breathe at least you're also checking if they're breathing so check their chests their stomach are they moving in an even rate in are they expanding and contracting like normal or is it not doing anything check underneath their nose um, you know can you see or feel any sort of exhale or inhale um, if you know how to check pulses check their pulse so you know you want to see if they or check underneath the neck you know if you can feel that there is a rhythm um, you know most likely the next pr uh, procedure that you move into will be CPR and it will be effective so if you're thinking about okay they're breathing fine there is no need for you to go into CPR but if they're not breathing then CPR is what you're going to be doing so uh, proper CPR techniques will thinking about um, the placement of your hands you know over you want to lock in your um, fingers between the other okay and then with the one that's the strongest you're pushing in the center of their chest okay here um, you will in cases need different pressures for the, the size of person that you're dealing with so if it's a bigger person like me you might need to use more pressure for a child you know you need to essentially use the two finger method in the center uh, it just differs from place to place if you're uh, checking for their breathing you know you'd want to kind of lift their chin up straight um, open up the mouth if you're going to be doing CPR it's not really any more recommended that you do it's okay if you do mouth to mouth and CPR in combination but um, if you just do CPR it's uh, as much as um, effective if not more so if you're going to be doing the breath you need to time it out equally I would say every second you want to be doing about uh, one two so that's a even though it sounds like it's not a second so one two three four five six so you're locking it in and you're pushing it forward into them over you want to be leaning over them and pushing into the chest you want to have your chest over the um, casualties the center of their body have your palm in the center where you're applying pressure and up and down um, if it becomes too difficult for you 
uh, you might want to instruct other people while you're doing it um, and that's perfectly fine as long as you're making sure that they're doing it as correctly as possible as you are um, if you are going to be doing the um, the mouth to mouth situation if you can protect yourself in any way if you've got any mouth guards or things like that put it in place so you have least amount of contact you know if there's open wounds you don't want to be messing around with that so you know just slightly um, hold the chin have it open if you can have a nice grip over the nose and the chin and then blow in and then go back to the CPR um, time it out properly you don't want to be doing the CPR and the mouth to mouth at the same time so have it in synchronization okay um, once they've come back put them in the recovery position um, which is essentially putting them on their side um, as your trainer would go through it with you on how to put them in the recovery position um, you know put out their arm and 90 degrees from their body uh, fold in their the closest thigh to you over their body and then roll them over have them rolled and make sure their breathing is open just in their mouth um, if you're not getting any feedback then you need to go into defibrillation so you're not in the uh, recovery position you in the recovery position you need the AED as you don't see any response from your CPR happening so then if you have an AED then you get lucky but if you're out somewhere where there is no AED you need to keep doing CPR until triple um, zero you know the paramedic get to you okay all right so now let's move into uh, providing the first aid when we're thinking about um, the first aid itself uh, we want to be able to put them in the recovery position afterwards if they're okay if they're um, you know feeling like they are dizzy if they've been in a serious situation but we want to be able to put them in the position and make them as comfortable as possible all right so if we're thinking about the injuries you know we could be thinking about um, you know if they've fallen from heights you know they could have broken their back or any bones so we don't want to make too many movements as long as they're out of any possible danger we we'll want to get it out um, get them out of that way as soon as possible okay so other things we could be thinking about are you know choking cardiac arrest, um, possible poisonings or shocks or bites um, from animals, um, if they've got severe bleeding or burns, how are we going to control those things, if they've had an internal injury, internal bleeding or swelling or reaction to any foods. We need to be calling ambulances at, if we think it's really serious and if I would need an ambulance called on me I'm sure that person's gonna need an ambulance for them as well if it's a simple small cut on the thumb yeah you, you need to um, try and deal that, with that yourself there's other important situations around the world or just in your area that's happening but if you've got you know a severed hand you need to call the ambulance okay um, so activity 1C, you are called to a scene, so this is a role play situation, you are called to a scene to assess the casualty who has fallen in the workplace. They are conscious and coherent, but appear to have injured their wrist in the fall. Assess the casualty using the DRS um, ABCD check. After assessing the casualty, verbally outline to your assessor how you would proceed with administering first aid in this scenario based on your assessment. So DRS, ABCD, um, we're thinking about the danger. Okay, um, what sort of danger is present? So thinking about your environment, if people are working, you need to let everybody know, look, there's a situation, stop. All right. Uh, minimize the risk for, so R, think about the risk that's happening in this case. If they have, um, you know, broken their wrist, they might have, something must have fallen with them or maybe they've fallen off something and that equipment is malfunctioning or 
on the floor somewhere so how can we eliminate that put it to the side so it's not near the casualty or remove the casualty from that premises somehow if they're able to all right um then we're going to be talking about um s so then think about okay i need to send for help if it's something small like a cut or a broken wrist in this case we don't really need to get the ambulance involved we might just get a manager in this situation um, a airway so we know the person's breathing uh, so A and B their mouth is not the issue they're breathing okay it's only their wrists so they don't need CPR and they're still conscious and talking to us and coherent so they don't need a defib uh, defibrillator um, so now that we have crossed that out um, you know we're trying to um, assist them with their sprained wrist we might get an ice pack some sort of bandage to kind of hold the sprain in place um, so if it's the wrist we might wrap it around to just give it a bit more firmness so the swelling is kind of restricted as much as it can be um, giving that ice pack um, will also help restrict that and getting the person to sit down somewhere giving them a bit of water so they can drink making them feel a bit more comfortable if need be send them to a a doctor or the uh, hospital and get them checked up and then once they get the clear and they feel okay to come back to work um, it should be uh, coming back to work as soon as possible then all right so write that down for that question um for make sure you follow the drs abcd check um if i were you i would break it down i would write danger i would write risk i would write send for help airway breathing uh, cpr and the defibrillator and then just say for that scenario what you would do so if you were going to remove the danger maybe remove the ladder or whatever okay if you are going to eliminate the risk, take the person away from the environment that they were in before, send for help, maybe call a manager, um, check the airway as they're talking to you, it's fine. As they're breathing normally, that's okay as well. They don't need CPR because they're not um, you know, in a state where they need CPR and they're breathing fine. And they don't need defib because they're talking to you, so they don't need, they don't need to administer shocks to the body all right let's move on to the next one you're called to the scene to assess a casualty who is presenting uh, with the symptoms of a cardiac arrest so assess the situation and seek for assistance for any emergency responses services okay so this one is serious so you got symptoms of cardiac arrest first of all we're looking for any possible dangers that are around um maybe the location uh or if they're in a car, anything like that. We're trying to eliminate the risk, so we might move them away from that. We might, and um, you know, route traffic another way, if possible. We might move them out of the place that they're in now into a more comfortable position. Okay, there's, then we would send for help. So in this case, if I think that they're clutching really hard and they um, things are not looking good, send for help. And if I'm not, if I'm thinking, okay, um, I'm the only person here, all right, then I need to take a minute, call Triple O, and then get back to the casualty. If there are people there, I need to get them to call. And instead of me taking out my phone, I need to stay with the casualty and try and get them through this as best as possible, keep communication open, try and get them to blink or move other parts of their body so they stay with me, they don't fall asleep or... Uh, wither away into the cardiac arrest um, try and lower the pressure on them any way possible think about their airway if they're breathing if they're sitting uncomfortably get them into the recovery position in this situation if they're breathing still then and there's no need for CPR but if they've now stopped breathing you would go into CPR and uh, once you've done CPR and the situation doesn't get better you would need to engage a defibrillator if it's around so if you're around a workplace most likely you will have a defibrillator but let's say if you're at home you just need to stick to the CPR until triple O gets to you 
All right. So break it down into the RS ABCD. Write the uh, possible steps you're going to follow for that situation, and then unpause the video when you're ready, and we move on to the next one. All right. Two point one. Perform cardiopulmonary resuscitation, so CPR, in accordance with Australian Resuscitation Council guidelines. So our guidelines. So performing CPR, you're gonna check for response and normal breathing. Uh, recognize the abnormal breathing or no um, breathing if there. Open and clear the airway. So you're thinking about, okay, is there something stuck in their mouth? Um, if not, try and clear it. Is their tongue straight out? Everything. Can you see anything visible that might be obstructing their airway? If so, can you remove it? Um, use correct hand location and compression rate in line with the ARC recommendations. So every second you're going one, two, one, two, one, two. Right? So you're putting, you're locking in your fingers over your um, your weakest hand and then whichever is, is your strongest hand you're going you're going to be applying the most pressure with that positioning yourself over the center of that person's body perp perpendicular to them so meaning if they are lying down straight you are you need to be there okay uh, hovering over their body so that um, you're putting all your force from your shoulders okay all right, so, and you're going to be doing that as long as possible. If you've got an AED, then you'd move into AED and CPR. But if you're just giving CPR, you're waiting for your um, triple O personnel or first responders or paramedics, whoever is just going to come and help you. All right, so, yeah, if there are vomiting, um, try and remove move them from that vomiting don't keep them in their own filth um, make sure to clear the airway if you can um, sometimes it can get gross especially um, teen parties a lot to do with alcohol vomiting choking on their vomit overdoses on al um, alcohol and other recreational drugs um, they most likely die because they have vomited but they were sleeping in a way that didn't allow them to expel, expel that vomit out of their system so now it's essentially clogging their airway because now all of their system is just filled with that vomit um, so yeah get them into the recovery position get everything out um, try and smooth it out as possible and then get them back out into the CPR situation if it doesn't get any better um, Yes, yeah, so especially if you're the single rescuer, um, you need to follow specific steps because if you are the only one there, you're not going to be able to call for help. So, um, yeah, you're not going to get anybody else to call for help. So you need to call for help before you start the procedure. So if you think it's serious, call for help first and then move on to everything else. Maybe put your phone into a loudspeaker situation. While they monitor you, they could have sent the paramedics out to you in the people on the line will also help you through this if you forget so when you call triple o they'll they're more than welcome to help you through the cpr process until um, medical personnel get to you using aed um, to use the aed do not touch the unconscious person's body tell everyone to stand clear so a lot of this does happen with the machine itself um, so during while you have the pads on it it will tell you where to put the pads Okay, so in my experience, it's a lot to do with the sh um, the chest and the rib cage. It just depends on where it is. If it's a hairy person, you might want to try and find the least hairy point of the person so the shock can be administered properly. Um, if you're thinking about um, you know where they are, maybe you want to get them in a place where it's comfortable for them and you to do this because you are going to have to do CPR at the same time so L the most comfortable you can't just get them to a bed somewhere um, alright so determine whether they need the shock you don't want to give giving shocks to somebody that's already you know responsive 
try and get responses back from the person, talk to them, see what's going on. Um, once everything's, you know, okay and done with, make sure, um, you know, you check with everyone, debrief everyone, and see everything is okay. Stay with the person until Triple O gets to you, um, paramedics get to you. Alright. Um, press the shock button when you're ready. Expect the person to jump. Then they are shocked. Continue to follow the voice prompts delivered by the AED. So continue with the treatment unless emergency helps arrive, oh, help arrives to take over. So yet, like I said before, you need to keep going with CPR and AED. So shock and CPR. Shock and CPR. The AED will tell you when to stand clear and you would also repeat all the instructions that the AED is giving you if you have people around you. Um, yeah, so then once the person's showing signs of consciousness, you would stop administering shocks and if they are breathing normally, you would stop CPR and put them in the recovery position. Um, if you've got people around you, it could be beneficial to you to just quickly train them in the CPR situation because CPR is probably the easiest one to teach at that situation just the compressions anyway and not not the whole thing but the compression so they can do the compressions you can uh, make sure that they're clear whenever uh, the AED is telling you to stay clear you can do the mouth to mouth if you're willing to do that you're just moving back and forth but CPR um, if you're getting too tired you can include someone else into that position as well Alright, so rescue breaths, um, to administer rescue breaths, like I said, pinch their nose, lift their chin, place your mouth over their mouth and make a lip seal, so like this, um, if I was going to do it myself, like that, and then around my thumb and my, yeah, my two thumbs, I would try and do the best seal possible around these two positions, and then, um, slowly um, breathe in firm like every five seconds or three seconds for children or infants um, and then you want to see them kind of expand like you would when you're breathing you want them to kind of inflate as you blow in and then normally as they go out okay all right so wait five to ten seconds before checking for breathing again continue the process until they are breathing again so CPR and rescue breaths if you are willing to do so otherwise just CPR continue CPR alright 2.2 uh, a the following task will be undertaken in a simulated workplace environment using an adult male mannequin to represent the casualty so we've got mannequins in the classroom ready for you as your trainers have so as you guys would have gone through it, the CPR situation, uh, you're caught to the scene, you've got an unresponsive male, you need to kind of um, make yourself clear you, who you are, that you're going to help them. If they say that they don't want help, you don't give them help, but if they do um, and they can't respond to you, that's when you, you know, proceed with giving them uh, help, checking the airways, um, sending for help if um, you're the only one in the place you would seek help call triple O then check their airways breathing and then move on to the CPR once if the CPR is not effective if you have an AED around proceed to moving on to the AED the defibrillator if um, uh, yeah, and you want to have a mix of the CPR and the defibrillator. So you need to do this for as long as, even though the task says two minutes, your trainer will say um, might give you a specific time. It won't be less than two minutes, but they'll give you a certain period of time to do that, and then maybe they incorporate the AED in the next task. Okay, so you just write down what you would have done following the DRS ABCD you'd check for danger eliminate any risks that are possible send for help check the airways um, see if they're breathing in this case they're not breathing so you would go into CPR 
um, you know every second you do two compressions so you're going um, one two three four five six so when you count like that it's essentially one second for every one two so if you're counting 60 that would be roughly around 30 seconds so you're going one two three four five six um, I think the staying alive song if you sing that so ha 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 so if you follow that rhythm and tempo um, if you need that to kind of keep you going you can do that if you've got other people incorporating them into the CPR and if you're going to be doing the rescue breaths or the mouth to mouth pinching their chin and their nose and doing a proper seal over their mouth and then blowing to see um, for five sec five to ten seconds or five to three seconds for children <coughs> and you want to see the expansion of their chest cavity um, so that your breaths are working if you're if they're not expanding your breaths aren't really working so go back to CPR and you have to do this until if you have an AED you would incorporate the AED if not you do the CPR until you get triple O to your location okay 2.2 Provide first aid in accordance with established first aid principles. <clears throat> the principle of first aid include taking immediate action, remaining calm at all times, ensuring actions are deliberate and careful, protecting yourself and others before anything else, assessing for danger before you act, assess your limitations, seek um, expertise and assistance, if necessary. So in any case that is serious, call triple O. You don't wait on that, okay? And uh, don't you know be slow on the action. Take as much action or include other people who can take the action if you're not um you know strong enough to do so. You need to be calm so you can think clearly and make sure any action that you are taking makes sense and is logical. Follow the DRS ABCD process. Um, remove the danger, eliminate the risks, um, you know, when you're sending for help, make sure if you are the only person there, you do that first, and then move on to everything. If um, they're not breathing and their airways and open, then you go into CPR. If, if the CPR is not working, you go into AED with CPR and do that until you get triple O to come to you. Okay, so role play activity with a partner. Role play your first data response. So you guys need to partner up in here, but essentially what you'll need to write is what you have done. So a minor injury could be um, a sprained wrist, cut um, finger, could be a um, a minor burn, how did you handle that, could be um, an allergic reaction, things like that, what did you do in, in that case. So you need to do this twice, um, one for you, one for your partner, okay, and then write the report for what you did. So half a page to one page should be enough for that one. So pause, complete it, Come back when you're ready, unpause, and we move on to the next one. Okay, 2.3. Displayed respectful behavior towards casualties. So, important, you know, culturally aware. If they don't want, some cultures don't like men touching women that they don't know. You know, if it's children, you need to reassure them that you're not doing anything appropriate. You're only doing what's needed to get them back on track. Um, you know treating adolescents as adults and not making them feel any lesser than they are being mindful of the reduced capacity of elderly casualties so um, you know brittle bones thinking about the movement how fast they would be the approach so culturally the approach could be different you may need to treat them a bit differently just making sure you're keeping all those factors always asking if you can help if you can't get, um, you know, if they're not being responsive, then you can uh, approach them and give your first aid. 
but if they say no I don't need any help from you technically they have refused your help this is where you can't help them if they refuse your help and they can communicate and refuse your help you can't help them okay so to see so again with your partner um, you'll need to pretend for these three different things and write down how you would react and then how you would provide a first aid to these people in the situation and you need to be respectful you know mindful of them uh, you know try and get their consent before if they're not responsive then move into the acts you know try and be if it's a female or male or whatever don't just start ripping clothes off people to see what's happening be mindful of the people around you the background they might not want you to be touching them so what's the most respectful way you can do it and ultimately if they don't want you to help you can't do anything okay so in those cases what will be the most important thing as a child you're making sure that you're reassuring them about what you're doing and what they need to do treat them like an adult don't treat them like children when elderly people you're taking a bit more care because they might be more you know brittle and old their sp speed might not be as quick as yours so they're not reacting as quickly as you are um, different ethnic backgrounds it's a different approach if it's um, if you've got a female around you you might incorporate them if it's a female if they don't want you to be touching them you can guide the other person that can be um, touching the casualty and you can guide them through the CPR process or the first aid process it's just about what's present and how you can do it if ultimately if they don't want any help you can't give them any help but if they can't respond to you you should if you want to provide as much as you can okay alright so half a page on that one break it into three like I said before how you deal with these three people and then once you're done with that unpause the video and we can move on to the next one so 2.4 obtain consent from casualty where possible so you need to get the consent of one um, the one you provide first aid to before administrating any treatment uh, if possible so if they're not communicating with you it's okay but if they are communicating and they say no no then it's a no go if you act without obtaining consent you may face, uh, face legal action in the future so be aware of that um, if the casualty is unconscious mentally incapable of making decisions intoxicated or delusional then um, you know it's kind of it's in an odd position because sometimes um, if they're in a in a state where they don't know what's good for them um, you know you can't really judge it so if if you can see okay they're overly intoxicated and they don't know what they're saying then you might approach that so then you might not be in any legal issues but sometimes you don't know how intoxicated they are so if they're talking um, and they're responding to you and saying no no stay away from me whatever then you might have to stay away even though it's in their best interest to get help from you and also are in a competent state are entitled to refuse treatment even if it is life-saving so like I said before um, they can refuse your help and you have to abide by that you if they say no you just have to say okay all right uh, all right 2d why is it important to obtain consent from people whom you administer first aid to so you don't want to be in any legal harm you want to be respectful so those two things are main um, and essentially you don't want to be doing anything that they don't want you to be doing so in which circumstances may casualties refuse treatment so if they are coherent if they know what they're talking about and you you know you think that they know exactly what they're saying that's when they can refuse what is implied consent and when might it apply so implied consent you're thinking about um, how does this um, affect you as a person in the sense of are they um, communicating can they communicate are they not responsive at all so you need to now judge it in the sense of okay if they can't communicate I should help them if they can give you 
physical kind of body gestures and they're saying no 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 but now you're thinking of okay um, what is um, the best possible solution are they um, intoxicated okay maybe you still have consent there but if they know what they're talking about then you don't have consent so implied consent only applies when you've got um, heavily intoxicated people that don't know or are in the, aren't in the right mind or that they can't communicate with you okay uh, this is a role play activity turns out with a partner okay first aid and competent adult casualty role play the first aid obtaining okay so you guys will just need to write down a process within each other on you approach the person you saw their uh, problem or their injury and you said hi this is me XYZ blah 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 um, can, I'm a trained first aid professional can I provide some first aid to you and if you're willing so I can start as, as soon as now um, and if they refuse you'd say they have refused and I did not provide any first aid or you'd say they accepted my assistance and I have provided first aid to the sprained ankle or whatever it might be right so once you're done with that unpause the video and come back and we can go on to the next one so we got 2.5 use available resources and equipment to make the casualty as comfortable as possible operate first aid equipment according to manufacturers instructions alright so if we're talking about making them feel comfortable if we've got anything around them that could be comfortable like pillows put on their heads under injured limbs elevate the limb if possible keep them warm using any blankets or clothes most um, first aid kits will have a thermal blanket which is really thin but it essentially adjusts to your body temperature and give, brings you to a more central uh, it's not too cold it's not too hot it's just a steady temperature um, provide pain relief using bandages and slings use heat or cold packs so ice packs or any heat packs that could be done in that situation just to create the illusion of it being more comfortable at least sometimes um, it's not comfortable at all so you need to move on to just reassuring them everything's going to be okay don't worry don't um, stress out we've got emergency stuff in the way uh, how can I make this any more comfortable okay you need a bit of water okay so just um, try and make it as comfortable as possible during that situation resources at the scene so you you're, you've got every most workplaces will have first aid kits bandages and slings gauze uh, cleaning equipment emergency blankets um, you can also make do with jumpers as pillows towels for blankets coats for blankets torn t-shirts for bandages so just use your brain see what's going to cause the least amount of infection in that situation but um, yeah there's many ways to provide this so it's a legal requirement under state and territorial legislation to have fully stocked first aid kit in the workplace they should be stored somewhere safe and their location clearly marked the actual requirements for the contents of the kit will vary depending on industry you work in its applicable risks so for us we don't think about a lot of sprains and broken bones but we do deal with a lot of burns um, we deal with a lot of cuts so we go through a lot of bandages in band-aids we go through a lot of um, cling wrap even though you know it's it's essentially to avoid any clothing when it's burnt um, that skin wants to heal so if you've got any material over the top that's going to stick to that scab it's going to heal with that and then trying to get that off is painful so we use a lot of cling wrap if we've got large burns so it doesn't necessarily stick to the skin or scab itself so it allows more uh, it's got protection from infection as much as possible and then allows 
you know, no material to get into that open wound there. Alright, so... 2E must simulate delivering first aid to casualties presenting with the following injuries or health conditions, so hypothermia, sprain and deep cut on the hand, so break the page down into three and um, outline possible solutions what you would do, so for hypothermia, make them feel warmer, get them something warm, change if they've got wet clothes, change them out of their clothes if possible, um, give them you know, a comfortable position, increase the heat, things like that. Um, give them a hot drink. So instead of a sprain, elevate the sprain. Um, get compression on it, hot packs, uh, sorry, cold packs, depending on what type of sprain it is. Um, what else? We're going to talk the person through it. We're going to be putting bandages on the sprain to try and control the swelling as much as possible. Um, if it's a fracture, we would try and do a sling. So it just depends. A deep cut on the hand. If it's deep enough to where the bleeding doesn't stop, you might um, need to call triple O. But in the sense of, okay, I've been able to manage their bleeding, they're all good, send them home or send them to the doctor, get them checked medically and then they come back once they're all clear. So with the hypothermia as well, if you've got to think about um, how serious it is, if it's really serious, call triple O. With the sprain, I would not really suggest if it's a mild sprain to call triple O and waste their time. You could take them to the hospital and get them checked. Um, deep cut on the hand, yeah, it really depends on how deep. Um, and yeah, so break it down use the uh, the equipment in the in the classroom and then once you're done I'll write the answer so unpause the video when you're ready and then come back and we will continue on to the next one it's 2.7 monitor the casualties conditions and respond in accordance with first aid principles so uh, after treatment ask casualties what happened in the build up to the incident you know, we're really creating a story and we're trying to build out why it happened so we can try and eliminate this in the future. If they're experiencing numbness or tingling, if they're experiencing lightheadedness or nausea, if they are experiencing any pain and get them to describe it. So if it's really bad, you know, we can tell the authorities and they can essentially deal with it accordingly to the rate of how painful it is. The rate of intensity of the pain, uh, if the pain is constant or it comes and goes. So all this will really help the uh, paramedics adjust to your casualties problem and solve uh, or at least mend um, whatever is happening. So once they reach the hospital they can move forward with bigger treatment. Duty of care in the workplace, the duty of care means providing treatment, recognize symptoms and give first aid in <coughs> compliance with procedures and protocols, reporting after the incident according to procedures and legislation, self-evaluation and debriefing to identify required improvements and individual performance requirements. So, you know, when you're providing the treatment, make sure you're providing it to the best of your ability. Once you've well, once you're done with it, you'll need to create a report, an incident report, so um, all the personnel in the business or around you know what's happening. If it's in an open environment where it might be paramedics, you need to create a verbal report. So you you'll need to give them what happened. This is what happened. Um, this is what I've done, and this was the outcome. So self-evaluation, we're thinking about what did we do that we could have done better or did we do things that were exactly how we were supposed to do them or did we do it really badly, how can we improve, do we need more training, things like that. So 2F, um, in the workplace or in our 
training rooms. Conduct the secondary assessment of the casualties you have treated for hypothermia, sprain, and cut. So this is with your partners. And monitor the condition. Ensure that you apply first aid in the principles of in your response. So <clears throat> we're thinking about uh, following the DRS ABCD um, in all these cases. So we're breaking it down. We eliminated. We look for danger. Eliminated the risk. Um, sent for help if we needed it. If it was something serious like um, you know severe hypothermia or deep cuts that were not controllable. Um, and the bleeding was not being controlled properly. We'd sent for triple O. We then move on to ABCD, so airway. If it's clear, we move on to breathing. If they're breathing, or if they have elevated breathing, we try and calm them down. Then if they uh, become unconscious, we'd go into CPR and um, defibrillator but in this case they're all okay so we just stop at controlling their breathing calming them down making them feel comfortable and then administering the first aid so in case of hypothermia make them as comfortable and warm as possible drinks clothing things like that um, and then waiting for the paramedics to get to the location <coughs> In the case of a sprain, elevating the sprain, making them comfortable, thinking about what sort of solution they need, in uh, if they need compression, if they need hot packs, just depends on the strain and the level of pain that they have, um, and then waiting with them until they feel more comfortable to go to the doctors, or if they just want to take it easy for a while, so we come back and in and just check on them periodically. And then with the cut, um, you know, try and stop the bleeding as much as possible. If not, if it's not stopping, we'd call the paramedics or triple O. And then try and stop the bleeding as much as possible until they get here. <coughs> try and make them feel as, mu as comfortable as possible. Um, try and remove any possible infections, meaning like infectious things such as loose material or any um, debris from the, the location that might be present, things like that. Right, so write those responses down and then um, unpause the video and come back and we'll move on to the next one. Okay, 3.1. Accurately convey incident details to emergency response services. Report details or incident to workplace supervisor as appropriate. So types of details that you want to remember when you're giving the reports verbally or even physically that you want to write down is the time of the incident, uh, things that happened to the events that ha uh, happened accordingly that, or at least you think that happened if the casualty is not responsive. The treatment that you gave, so CPR could be AED, could be bandages, whatever you did, you need to clearly outline it. And the response to the treatment, did the casualty you know, gain some um, steady breathing or did they gain consciousness and they started talking to you or um, was your um, bandages too strict and it started, you know, going purple so you had to loosen the bandages. Whatever, you, whatever happened, you need to uh, state it step by step to them, okay? And keep calm so you're not jumbling around your words making sure that they can understand you. Uh, written reports are useful if your organization has officially uh, official first aid report forms to fill out immediately after the event. We also include incident forms. will need to be passed on the workplace supervisor and stored in the company records. So this is very much to do with insurance, but you've also got to think about privacy. If the first aid, um, you know, the person that's the casualty tells you that they have diabetes, you can't really tell that to somebody. If they tell you that they're transgender or whatever it might be, that's it's personal. It stays between you and the company and the supervisor that you give the forms to. So they, if this information leaks out, you will get sued, the company will get sued as you are leaking out their personal information. So do not do that, Okay, even if you don't like this person okay it's gonna come bite you so privacy is very important all right especially in the workplace 
in any place, and you know, you don't want to be disrespectful to anybody. If you're, if you're trying to help them, just keeping that respect between one another is not going to um, harm you in any way. Alright, so 3A, uh, you'll need to complete the tasks based on the scenario above. So fictional, uh, health and safety incident, and so yeah, you want to make sure you know what, um, when it happened, where it happened, um, what were the events, so this is what you need to make sure that you write, um, what you did to address the casualty, and what the response was from the casualty to the first aid that you gave them. Okay, so this will be undertaken with a partner, and, and switch roles in between. Okay, um, yeah, so you guys will have an incident report template that you'll need to fill out, um, and then a written statement that you'll need to write. Um, so the written statement could be half a page and just saying what happened. So think about the the role play that you've done in the classroom. So in my case it could be that I was in the workplace, I was called upon by one of my colleagues to provide first aid to a another colleague who had fallen off the ladder and sprained his ankle. So in this case I had first of all con contacted my supervisor to let him know that the issue has happened and to uh, if possible to get in touch with triple O because it's very serious or do not get into t in touch with triple O because it's a simple sprain we can control it with bandages and ice packs and we can make the person comfortable or if we need to get them to a doctor and if we can do it ourselves and it's not too much of an emergency and then what we did um, for the casualty so we um, tightly bandaged up the area of the sprain we gave them an ice pack we gave them hot and cold beverages we made them feel comfortable in the staff room whatever we did and then afterwards the debrief to the supervisor as he gets on to the location then completing the report so the report would be similar um, we've got templates available in the workbook just complete those and then move on okay draft a written statement of the incident for your supervisor so yeah you just want to write that what we just spoke about in that um, structured process once you're done come back unpause the video and we'll move on to the next one Okay, 3.3. Maintain confidentiality of records and information in line with statutory and organizational procedures and policies. So, we don't want to be um, leaking out information that was trusted to us. Even though we can go through other people's records, it's um, we can be sued if we let that information out, if we're in a supervising position. So we don't want to be doing that. So any personal information obtained during first aid procedures need to be kept confidential and access to it only provided to the authorized personnel. The types of information required include medical conditions of patients, types of treatment provided, results of any tests that were previously done. Alright, so now activity 3B, list of the 13 Australian privacy principles that apply to handling of personal um, information as it is laid out in Schedule 1 of the Privacy Act. So we just want to list uh, five of them, list three pieces of privacy legislation relevant to first aid practice. So we're just doing some research in this activity there. Uh, so for number two as well, complete all necessary documentation that would have been required for the health and safety incident outlined in the fictional scenario uh, provided in activity 3A. Right, a two to three hundred words, so one uh, page will be enough for this one. How you maintain confidentiality records and information in line with statutory or organizational policies and how confidentiality for these records will be maintained in the future. Attach this summary to your workbook. So in the space provided, you'll need to essentially write um, all the reports that you've gotten, all the tests, results, they are only kept um, for the company's knowledge and not for other workers' knowledge. 
has to be kept private, stored in a secured place that can be locked, um, will not be given out to anybody that is not appropriate or has a specific job role to know these things, things like that. Just elaborate on, on that and then complete that and come back, unpause the video and we'll move on to the next one. So 4.1, recognize the possible psychological impacts on self and others, uh, other rescuers involved in critical incidents. So we're thinking about how, you know, the aftermath is after providing first aid. So a lot of people might be seeing blood, death. So how does this impact everybody involved? So thinking about the physical symptoms like headaches, fatigue, aches and pains, muscle cramps, flushing and sweating, Emotional symptoms like depression, anger, frustration, fear, worry, impatience and anxiety. Mental symptoms like a lack of a concentration, memory, loss of sense of humor. Behavioral symptoms like crying, swearing, smoking, um, drinking, pacing, nervous habits. So things like that they've never done before or doing more of the bad habits that they have. Things like that. What uh, is it impacting them negatively to a point where it's taking over their lives we are, we're really having to talk to them about what's happened and see what we could do as a company to lessen the blow of this because they might have witnessed somebody that they've worked with for years um, die in front of them which would take a severe toll on that person so it's our responsibility as humans not just as a company but as humans to look after one another so if we can do the best that we can to lessen the blow as, as a group um, it's our responsibility to do so dealing with stress to deal with stress you could avoid taking on too much work people who make you stressed um, alter your behavior adapt your routines accept your limits distract yourself from things that might cause you too much stress get healthy, do some exercise, eat a bit healthier, you know, just to improve your mood and your physical uh, presence. Alright, so activity 4A, list the four main categories of psychological impact that may affect a rescuer after involvement in a critical incident. Provide two examples of symptoms that each category list. So we've got the your psychological, um, there's four, um, so just take out the four, I would say physical, emotional, mental and behavioral and then give me an example such as headaches and fatigue for physical, depression and anger for emotional, mental could be lack of concentration or memory loss, behavioral such as crying or smoking or doing things that aren't really uh, normal for their normal everyday actions. Um, List seven methods you could use to avoid or deal with stress. So we've got the seven there, get healthy, distract yourself, accept your limits, adapt your routines, alter your behavior, avoid taking on too much work and to try and relieve stress anywhere possible. So complete that, uh, unpause the video and come back when you're ready. And we'll move on to the next one. 4.2, participate in debriefing to address individual needs. So we'll need to group up once we're there we should bear in mind that some first aid situations may evoke strong emotions among those in the world especially if they are traumatic events these are no set guidelines for what is traumatic um, because uh, trauma can be different to different people in a few cases the symptoms of distress can develop in chronic illness which may need long-term treatment counseling services need to be made available to those affected. Uh, Train debrie uh, debriefers help the workers to explore and understand the range of issues including the sequence of events, the causes and consequences, each person's experience, any memories triggered by the incident, normal psychological reactions to critical incidents, methods to manage emotional responses resulting from a critical incident psychological um, first aid so really it's not nothing that we're doing 
in the sense of providing any bandage. It's very mental, right? So we're trying to reassure them, just having chats to them, making them feel safe, uh, making sure that they don't feel left out, connecting them and giving them some sort of belonging, uh, making them feel calm and hopeful, um, allowing them to access any support that they may need. So it could be... Uh, you know, physiotherapy or some sort of um, counselling mentally, anything like that. Maybe reduce stress by giving them a holiday or taking, allowing them to take some time off or paid leave. Um, see what needs they have and being able to meet those needs so they can get their mind straight. Develop coping mechanisms so that they can at least adjust to this new situation and adjust to life after this event so you know if somebody close to them has died and they will need some time to adjust to this it's not going to be a next day they're back to normal and everything's okay you're going to have to speak to them see what's up how they're dealing with it and what could be the possible solution for you if they're not dealing with it and how could you help them to move on from this all right let's five aims of psychological First aid, so we want to make them feel safe, uh, give them a sense of belonging, make them feel calm or helpful, give them any sort of support that they may need, reduce the stress, um, you know, if any needs need to be met, give them some coping mechanisms, things like that. Provide CPR in a simulated work environment, in a new simulated work environment, participate in the briefing session for this incident. So we need to look back at the CPR situation and then write a debrief. So we'll need to talk about what was done, how you did it, why you did it, um, how you conducted the CPR, did anything get better afterwards. So think about, okay, you um, follow the DRSABCD process, so you look for danger, you eliminated the risk, you sent for help, you check their airways so that it wasn't obstructed, you check their breathing and they weren't breathing so you moved into CPR, you did your compressions with um, a timely manner with a consistent rhythm, then you moved on to um, AED if there was one uh, and waited for a response between the rescue breaths, the CPR and the AED and once the casualty was able to respond to you, you stopped providing CPR and then moved them into the recovery position, making them feel comfortable in any possible way and waited for Triple O to get to you until then. Alright, so this is the last activity. Once you complete this one, we still got assessments left after this. So the learner workbook will be complete. Submit that to your trainer. Um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to get in touch with me. Uh, my email is admin at wisemaneducation.com.au um, or send an email to your trainers and they'll be able to help you as well. So we've got the knowledge questions, skill and performance assessments left and the multiple choice. So the multiple choice you can do, it's online. Um, the knowledge questions will have to be written and the performance and skill will be performed in class with your trainer. So hopefully if you guys um, did not get a chance to really understand what was said, just revise and go back to any points that you missed out on or you're a bit confused in this video and just go through it again. And if you have any questions, feel free to get in touch with me, okay? So if you have any feedback, send me an email. If you have any questions, come in, see me or send me an email and I can try and answer it to the best of my ability if possible. Alright, so catch you in the next one.